Hello Unity fans! In the previous video, we added various visuals to the map to indicate upgrades to our woodcutter and stonemason cabins, making sure that units can interact with the buildings and also find their way past all the additional buildings without trying to walk through them. There's a link in the top right corner if you'd like to watch that one as well. While these cabins could be placed on the map by pressing certain keys on the keyboard with the mouse cursor on the target hex, we actually need to start developing a decent in-game user interface, so that the player can actually execute actions easier. This is what we'll take on today, so let's get going. Before a cabin can be placed on the map, we need to make sure that the terrain around its intended location is viable. It needs to be relatively flat, shouldn't be occupied by resources and should be free of seawater, lakes and rivers. We've already catered for testing for most of these restrictions in the previous video, where we had a temporary text message appearing over any hex that broke any of the rules. However, this only happened when you tried to actually place the cavern. It would be a lot better if we could see how the cabin would be placed as you searched through locations on the map, and have real-time feedback about the suitability of the locations. This is the first thing we tackle today. Our first step is to instantiate a temporary version of the cabin and all its features to show us how the cabin would look on the map. However, this cabin still hovers over the map by following the mouse cursor until you actually place it down by clicking the mouse while it's on a viable location. We will get to the UI icon in the bottom left in a while, but for now just assume that we have developed a method to create such a user interface version of the cabin already. Now as we move our cursor around, each time we jump to a new X, the viability of that location should be tested. Recall that our cabin requires not only the target hex, but a ring around that hex that is one hex wide. So we test the target hex and its 6 neighbors for a number of violations and highlight the hexes according to how they do in these tests. I have implemented green, yellow and red, where green indicates no issues, red indicates that the cabin could definitely not be placed there and yellow indicates that the location is not ideal but it could be placed there. In this case, yellow is only triggered if there is a difference in elevation of 1 between the target hex and the specific neighbor. So, we will allow up to one elevation level difference to be flattened out when placing a cabin. As it stands, the land gets flattened automatically when the cabin is placed, but it could be part of the game mechanics that the cabin would take longer to build if more hexes need to be flattened out first, making the location less inviting. So we indicate these hexes with yellow. We already have the functionality to highlight a cell by activating a hexagon border and setting its color to anything we like. This was used for indicating the path in the unit movement functionality. I have changed it a bit so that we now have a semi-transparent hexagon shape rather than only a hard border. I think this looks better in this situation. What we need to do now is switch on the correct highlight colors. When testing the hexes, we start out with all of them highlighted green. Then, if any of the hexes violate any of the rules, we change their highlight color. Note that we only allow the highlight color to worsen, otherwise we could highlight a hex red in one test and highlight it back to green in a subsequent test. Also note that we now test for rivers and water hexes as well, and we could add additional constraints here later as they arise, for example walled hexes, not being placed too close to existing cabins, etc. We could combine these tests into one if statement, but if we would like to be able to handle different violations differently later on, for example an appropriate text message as before, we should keep this structure in place. Note that when our cursor moves to a new hex, we also need to cancel the highlights of the previous hex. Additionally, we also apply the rotation of the cabin in real time. As before, we search the map for the closest resource of that type and rotate the UI cabin to face in that direction. If we now find a valid location for our cabin and click the mouse button, the real version gets instantiated and linked to the specific column of the map. 
and you know beforehand exactly how it would be rotated and positioned before committing to the location. The UI version of the cabin should now be destroyed. But we could also build in the functionality to keep placing cabins when say shift is pressed down when the cabin is placed and only destroying the UI cabin when shift is released before placing a cabin. We could also press escape at any time to cancel the placement if we wished. Ok, so let's get to the UI icons in the bottom left. We're going to place these on their own separate layer, so we create a new UI layer for them. Then we need an extra camera to render them on top of everything else. We make sure that this camera's depth value is higher than that of our main camera. It's also important to set the camera projection to orthographic so that everything looks flat no matter at what depth it lies. Finally, we select the Don't Clear flag and for the culling mask, we select only the dedicated UI layer. You can also delete the audio listener component since the main camera already has one. So let's get to the actual UI. We add an empty game object to keep everything together and make sure it's set to the dedicated UI layer. We add a UI canvas to it, make sure the render mode is screen space camera and link the dedicated UI camera to it. Under the canvas we're going to add three buttons. The first one is the main resources button. We're going to need quite a bit of UI on the screen and I want to be able to hide some of it from time to time. So my idea is to have a few main buttons along the bottom which expand into smaller buttons when they're clicked and collapse when they're clicked again. Our smaller buttons are for wood and stone for the moment. You can decorate these buttons as you wish and can include a multitude of effects to it. But for now we're just going to implement a simple functionality. Each button contains the resource building to be built at the top and the resources required to build it underneath. You will notice that these icons are three-dimensional. This allows us to animate them when the mouse is hovering over the button as a visual clue. To accomplish this, we create a very simple script that just rotates an object along any combination of the three axes you specify, but only if its pause value is false. We attach this script to each object on the button that we want to rotate. Then for the button itself, we add another simple script that takes an array of game objects and resumes or pauses their rotation when the mouse cursor enters or exits the button area. We set the event triggers for the pointer enter and pointer exit events accordingly. So whenever we now hover the cursor over any of these buttons, their icons would rotate as a visual prompt. In order to let the smaller buttons appear and disappear, we need to add an on-click event to the main button that tells it to expand or collapse the other buttons. We handle this in yet another simple script. All it does is call the appropriate animations attached to the other two buttons, then toggle the expanded state variable. The animations are added to the two resource buttons by adding an animator component and then creating very simple animations for them. Each animation is just an adjustment of the Y coordinate of the button. So the expand animation would take it from 100, which is behind the main button, to 375, which is somewhere above the main button 10 frames later. The collapse animation is the same thing just in reverse. We could add some slowing down before stopping and speeding up before zooming off, but this linear movement is quite okay for now. All we need to do now is to link these resource buttons on click events to the function that creates the appropriate UI version of the building and lets the game know that we are now in cabin placement mode. This method determines which UI button called it, then creates the appropriate cabin, woodcutter or stonemason, exactly like we did in the previous videos, except that testing the terrain for viability has now already occurred thus taking us back to where we started this episode, namely selecting a location on the map for the cabin, while being able to see how it would be placed in real time. In addition to using the escape key, we also want to be able to cancel the build if we click on the button a second time. And there we have our very simple but effective first UI attempt, and we can now place woodcutter and stonemason cabins on valid locations throughout the map.
please consider subscribing if you'd like to continue on this exciting journey with me. Also, drop me a comment to discuss anything related to the video. Goodbye.